Gulf Beach Baptist Church, the Church of the Beach. Today we're in the second of a series of four Sundays about pray, come, give, and go. So today we're talking about coming. I hope you're blessed by this service.
day. God is good. That was good, but it could be better. And I'm not letting you out for another 25 minutes, so you might as well get this really good right here. God is good. And all the time. Amen. The gospel prospers during the good times and the bad. Oftentimes more during the bad. Fair enough. But there is this underlying truth, and I wonder as we sing those songs and we clap and we have the beautiful singing and the beautiful playing, do we really believe that? If I hooked you up to a polygraph test, do you really believe that he is working all things together for your good? I can tell you this, I 100% in the depths of my soul believe that if you love the Lord and you are called according to his purpose, he positively 100% is working all things in your life for your good but he's also working everything together for his good and that's more important I hate to tell you but that is more important than your own so the gathering church are we going to move forward with this idea that we must come Now, I want to touch base on a couple of little things that are important and that we need to make sure that we cover as a group. And we're not going to read in Acts in chapter 2, but that's where all four Sundays this month, we're getting this idea of when the church was birthed, what did they do? What did it look like? How did God set it up for it to be? And so one thing that we identified right away is prayer. God moves. If you have anything going on in your life, we have the prayer board there, the prayer boards uh, down the hallway going towards the cafeteria and towards the, the office. Right up there, I'm telling you, it will be prayed on every single day. Yes. And have courage, church. Prayer works. Yes. Prayer works. We had double digits in our eight prayer service on Thursday morning. Y'all, you should come if you can. I understand if you have to work and you can't, but if you can be here at 8, 10 in the morning, you should come. It's very informal. It's very quick. There's not a whole lot of talking back and forth. It is we come in and we pray, and we pray, and we pray some more, and it's refreshing. It's good, and if you're like me, or at least like I was, it's hard for us to set aside time during our day. All of a sudden, it'll be night. We'll have eaten dinner. We're watching Law and Order or NCIS New Orleans, and we're sitting there, and it is like, wow, I haven't prayed all day today. And now I'm going to show some of your toes. Some of you get all the way to that point, and you don't even think, wow, I didn't pray all day today. You just didn't. And then you kind of feel bad about it, but then you convince yourself God's forgiving and merciful and loving, and so go to bed and you give it another shot the next day, right? But prayer works, but guess what? This early church, they came together. They gathered. There was strength in their numbers. The Holy Spirit worked amongst them as a group because they would fellowship and break bread. And we will start the Lord's Supper here in a couple weeks, the last Sunday of this month. We'll start back with that. I think it's been over a year since this church has celebrated the table. So we'll get back in the Lord's will there. But, but folks, part of the church being the church is that we gather and we come. Now, a couple things that I want to point out. And Sister Cindy, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and mention this. You know, she's, she's going to be skipping through a lot of slides because she's figuring stuff out. And sometimes I bounce a little bit. But, but folks, who or what is the church? If we're not careful, we think the church are these four walls, right? And then some of you that have been in church your whole life, you've heard this before and you're like, ah, I know that one. I know what he's about to say. And I am about to say it. Folks, the church locally is a called out group of believers that all are on a mission to serve Jesus Christ together. So the church at the beach is this local assembly, this local congregation, and we're on a mission to do what Jesus Christ has commanded and called us to do. Now there's also this sense of a universal church or a general church where everyone that ever has and ever will put their faith in Jesus Christ, they're a member of the church. Okay, But a lot of times, and and almost all of these New Testament letters that we study in this Bible, they're written to a certain local congregation. So I say that to say this. We don't come to church 
Now, I'll say it and you do too, just because it's habit. But really, we come to this property, 10620 Hutchinson Boulevard, we come to this property to gather as the church. And we need to have a good understanding of that so that we know this building is not called to go out and tell people about Jesus. No, the church is called to go out and tell people about Jesus. And I hate to put this on you, but that means you. That means you have to tell people about Jesus. I don't know why he did it. I would have never trusted you people. But the, I never would have done this. But for whatever reason, God's plan is that the church would go out and tell people about Jesus. They would put their faith in Jesus. They would be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. And then disciples would be made. And you can read that whole thing until the very end, very end of time. And some people think the church won't even be, be here anymore. We'll already be raptured up. Folks, not only is, is the church plan A for evangelism, there is no plan B. There's no plan B. So if you don't do it, and you don't do it, and I don't do it, guess what? People die, and they spend eternity in hell. That's why I say if I was God, I never would have done it that way. I would have said, that group, you have lost your mind. But that's what he chose. That was his desire, and that was his plan. And does that put the pressure on him? Heck yes. As a pastor, does that put the pressure on me that I better get these people moving for Jesus, sharing the gospel? You better believe it. There's a lot of pressure on these shoulders. Because I'm not willing Set aside with this old thought, 56% of people in the United States of America, maybe the percentage is a little lower here, but 56% of the people in America will never, ever step foot in a church house. So if we don't get outside these walls that are simply a building where we gather together at the church anyway, guess what we are saying, folks? We're saying that 56% of the people in America are going to die and go to hell without knowing Jesus Christ. Are you willing to stand there and say that? I'm telling you, I'm not. And I'll also go this far. Man, this is probably not good, but we've already taken up an offering today. I'm willing to tell you that if you're not on board about telling people for Jesus and evangelizing and sharing, I'm telling you, it might not be the right place for you. Because it is my job to lead you to holiness, and it is my job to lead you to where I can't tell everybody on this beach about Jesus. But doggone, we have 100 people in the first service, and almost 200, maybe 160 in this service. Doggone it, all of us together, we can tell this beach about Jesus so that this church is doing what Jesus said it was supposed to do. So come. Where are we going to be in the Bible today? You know what the church is. But I want to remind you that life is hard. First little one verse I'm going to read is out of John chapter 16. Jesus, he's coming close to the end of his earthly life. He's about to go to the cross. He just promised the apostles that he's going to send the Holy Spirit. He's he's about to go off into prayer on his own. And 2,000 years ago, this is encouraging, 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ prayed for you if you're a follower of Jesus. That makes me feel really special. 2,000 years ago, he had you in mind when he went and prayed. And guess what? The, one of the main themes of his prayer for the future believers is unity. But guess what? It's not about unity of me making you feel good or you pacifying me. It is unity about us being on a mission for Jesus. That is the prayer that Jesus gives in John chapter 17. But verse 33 John chapter 16. Follow with me now. These things I have spoken to you. Me. That's very important. In me. Tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. What does that mean? In me. Because it really seems if you read that. Unless you are in Jesus. The capital M there for me. All right. Unless you're in Jesus, you're not going to have peace. But also, here's the bad news. If you are in Jesus, you are going to have tribulation. 
But Jesus says, that's all right. Be of good cheer anyway. Because I'm the one that is going to take your place for everything bad that's supposed to come your way. And I've overcome all the bad that could be coming in your direction. So the word difficult or the thought of life's difficult. Jesus says that your life is going to be physically and emotionally difficult as a follower of Jesus Christ. I've got to tell you, you can go back into difficult times in your life. Think back, whatever it is. And when you go back into those difficult times in your life, you came to a crossroads and you had the choice, I'm either going to follow Jesus or I'm not. And guess what? He works it all together for good every time you choose Jesus. But you're going to have distress. You're going to be accused of things you didn't do. There's going to be many trials, many sorrows. But be courageous. Take heart. Be of good cheer. Have an inner happiness that no one can understand. Do you ever get accused of that as a Christian? Shame on you if you don't, Brother J.R. If you're never just so happy and full of cheer that everything's bad in business, you haven't sold a car in two months, three months. I don't know how often you sell Two days, I don't know. And, and man, you should be all down in the dumps. And somebody that works for you that's not a Christian comes in and says, man, how are you still happy with all of this bad stuff? I'm a follower of Jesus. I'm in him, and he has overcome whatever bad might happen. Folks, be courageous. But the last part of that verse has to connect back to the first part of the verse. All of that good stuff is possible if you are in him. Now, what does it mean to be in him? When you were saved, when you put your faith in Jesus Christ, you were baptized, not in water. Just, just listen to me now. You were baptized into the spiritual body of Christ. All right? And that might be a concept that you haven't been exposed to. And here we are on Sunday morning worship service, and I'm, you know, teaching and expecting you to grow as a Christian. I get it. Not a lot of fun. But you were baptized into the spiritual body of Christ and that puts you in him. And he's overcome the world. You can have courage. Now, the next thing that I want to read to you, or the next passage, is this. So since we are in him, if we have faith in Jesus Christ, I'm going to quickly read 1 Corinthians 15 verses right here. Hold on with me. I'll probably read a little more quickly than what you would read yourself. But you can do it. Make sure your Bible's turned on. You can follow along on the screen. For as the body is one, the church, or in this case, the universal church, and specifically the church in Corinth. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body, being many, are one. They're unified, just like I told you Jesus prayed for. So also is Christ. He's unified. He's, he's not unraveling. Jesus Christ is all together. Verse 13, for by one spirit, we were all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether slaves or free, anybody, I don't care. If you used to follow another religion, you are, you are more than capable of putting your faith in Jesus and becoming a Christian now. If you're black, white, red, yellow, green, I don't care. Anyone that desires to be saved can put their faith in Jesus Christ and will get in to the body of Christ. Whether slaves are free and have all been made to drink into one spirit. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Rhetorical question by Paul. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I am not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? Rhetorical question. We're hearing, where would be the smelling? But now God has set the members, each one of them, in the body just as he pleased. Mm. And if they were all one member, where would the body be? But now indeed there are many members, yet one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much rather, those members of the body which seem to be weaker are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, on these we bestow greater honor. Mm, that's not the way the church is supposed to work, right? We're supposed to build up the, the fancy 
well-spoken rich folks. Mm. And our unpresentable parts have greater modesty. But our presentable parts have no need. But God composed the body, having given great honor to the part which lacks it. That there should be no schism in the body, no split, unraveling. But that the members should have the same care one for another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now you are the body of Christ and members individually. And God has appointed these in the church. And then it goes on to list some offices and some jobs. Do you understand that? If someone in this church is struggling, I'm not talking about socialism. We are supposed to help them. If someone is homeless, we are to help them find a home. If, if someone has no food, we are called to help them get food. If someone can't pay their bill, then we are called to help them pay their bill. I'm not talking about enabling someone because we're all sick and tired of that. Fair enough? I'm talking about if someone is in our church, in our local called out group of believers, oh God, church, we got to step up and help them. If it means we have to make tough decisions financially, we'll make tough decisions financially. But we have to help the fellow believers of Jesus Christ because let me tell you, it ain't going to get any easier. We all better be united and on the same team. Now, it would be fair for you to say what Jay is talking about, talking about coming to church today or coming to the gathering of the church. See, I did it myself. He's talking about that. And so what Jay is saying is if for this church to be everything it should be, you've got to come. And you have to be active in it. That is true. But I'm going to flip it on you. I can help you figure out. I can't make you do it. I can help you figure out why God created you in your mother's womb. And why ever God created you, I can, I can help you go through some steps to figure that out. But guess what? I can't make you do it. And here's the kicker. Most of you think because you're used to pastors begging you and preachers begging you to show up and begging you to do this or do that. Here's the way that I'm going to look at this with you. You find out that you're supposed to be an eye in a body, like Paul was just using as the questions. You go out there and you see how good of an eye you are if you're just sitting out there on the sidewalk by yourself. If you're supposed to be the arm Yes, for the church to function the way that it should, it needs you. It needs the arm. But let's look at this one last time. Hebrews chapter 10. I'm going to read just a couple of verses right here. 23 through 27. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling or gathering of ourselves together, as is the manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day, the returning of Jesus approach. So folks, if you are really old and you haven't had your vaccines yet, if you are in a really high-risk category let me tell you, I appreciate and understand you being cautious and safe. I understand it. I can't put myself in your shoes. So as the you know, old saying on the street goes, leave the judge into Jesus, I guess. But I'm telling you right there, the commandment of the Bible says we're supposed to come gather as the church. We're supposed to be here. And that's the truth. And so, and to argue anything else would be to argue that the Bible's not true. Folks, I've got to tell you, and I've already given my disclaimer so nobody can take their ball and go home because Jay said that he had to, you know, I had to come to church. You can't do that. So I've already, I've already given, given that. But folks, right now is the time where this world needs the church. Panama City Beach needs the church at the beach to step up and be what it can and could and should be right now. Historically, we're not going to go back on some church history lesson, but I'm telling you, COVID-19 is absolutely nothing compared to what the church has had to persevere through throughout the last 2,000 years when it was instituted. Nothing. It's not even close. But again, 
I gave my disclaimer to not make anybody upset, I guess. But I do want to to say this. When we gather, and I say this in a way that like, I'm saying it jovially, but not. You know, you ever do that in life? Like, I'm kind of kidding, but there's, you know, something joking is only funny because there's some truth in it. When we gather, these things have got to happen. They must happen, okay? First one is, is that when we gather together, we have to consider one another. When you come to church gatherings or when you are with anybody in the church or doing anything out in the community as part of the church, do you perceive what other I think we're guilty of that. But scripture tells us that we're supposed to consider one another. What do you mean by consider? See, I think that's a little vague for us today. We don't really understand it. You need to perceive what other people are going through. If someone's hurting, you should be paying enough attention to your brother and sister in Christ that you perceive there's a problem and you go and you put your arm around them and you help them. That's what we're supposed to be doing when we gather. When you find out that there is a friend, maybe they live somewhere else, but but they are a church member in the universal church, the general church, you find out something's wrong, pick up the phone and call them. When you perceive someone needs you, Step up and do what they need you to do. The next thing that's supposed to happen when we come to church, we're supposed to provoke love and we're supposed to provoke good works. But that word provoke even has a negative connotation in 2021, right? Provoke. I don't know about that. Provoking. What has this context? Y'all remember cowboy boots with spurs on them? You know what I'm talking about? I don't really see many cowboys out here, but there might be some. But we're supposed to, as a group, we're supposed to be, bam! we got to get out there and get after it. We have to provoke, spur on love for other folks. We have to love our community enough that we go tell them about Jesus. We have to love other church members enough that we're willing to do without this or without that just a little bit for what is the great good of the church and provoke good works. That's one of the biggest myths and lies that you have been told growing up in America in the church is this lie that you are going to say a prayer one day when you're about 13 years old at a youth revival, and then for the rest of your life, you're good to go because I think I said one time that Jesus is my Savior. Ladies and gentlemen, if you have put your faith in Jesus Christ, then you are going to do good works. And as a body of believers, I firmly believe one reason get out of a body of believers is because they don't care anything about growing and doing good works for other people. It's not, I mean, come on, it's 1030 this morning. Who's not awake by 1030? It's not that people are sleepy or lazy. If I go there, I might have to do something for Jesus. No thanks. And then the last thing from that verse is we're supposed to encourage one another, build up, exhort. One of the worst things that I've seen as a pastor, and then even before I was a pastor, is when the mature Christians do something to hold back and put down a young, and I don't necessarily mean age, a young Christian. Folks, we're in this together. We're supposed to be unified on this beach and be unified around the entire world as people that have put their faith in Jesus Christ and we are to be encouraging each other building each other up, loving each other provoking each other to do good works day after day after day and if we're not I've, I've, got, I've got 20 more years of, of work life I don't know, I might have one day I might die today I'm not, I'm not going to meet Jesus and not obeyed what he told me to do. I encourage you, don't meet Jesus and you might get it. Not be able to be, I did it all that I could give you. I want that for you. But if we're going to do that, we have to gather, right? We have to come. But to transform your life, what are we looking for? Well, one thing that we're going to do is that when I read books about leading churches, they say, the experts say that you can get two times a week from people. The real good Christians will give you two times a week. But you know what? We're at the Church of the Beach. I love this church. I'm passionate about this church. It's a nice-looking place. We've got 
a good associate pastor, youth pastor, music minister, a good children's pastor. And so I'm going to walk out there and I am going to absolutely invite people to church and be proud of this church. Not in a bad way, but proud that we are fulfilling our mission to tell other people about Jesus. But one thing that we're going to do to do that better is here in about a month, month and a half, we're going to change some service times. So I'm going to ask, I've already asked those people, they're going to move back and start at 8.30. The 10 o'clock, 10.30 service, this service, started at 10. And I'm going to tell you why, unashamedly. Number one, I want people to get involved in discipleship groups, D groups. That's what the staff's going to call it. If you call it Sunday school, that's wonderful. But we can have Sunday school and just call it discipleship groups because that's what the pastor asks us to do, and I really don't make, like making him mad at me. But if you want to have your discipleship group on Sunday morning, fine. If you want to have it on any night of the week, fine. At a house here, whatever it is. But we have to get into a little bit smaller groups to where we live life together. Live life together, but live life together in a way that's glorifying to God. So that doubles our space. Here's another reason that we're going to change the service times is because it's going to be better for our children's ministry. Y'all might not know this because you might not come to the 8 a.m. service, but if a family comes to the 8 a.m. service, there's nothing for the children. Okay? So what we want is we want you to have this courage that you can invite families, come to this church. We are going to take care of your children. We are going to teach your children about Jesus. You know, one of the biggest funny, thing, funny things, and, and my wife's a public school teacher, so heaven help me, I hope I don't get her in trouble, is we will send our children to a school from kindergarten when they're five all the way until they're 18, uh, when they're in 12th grade, a senior, and they will learn about all kinds of God-forsaken things from their friends and from the textbooks and from everything else, and then we'll bring them to church and have them color a picture of Noah's Ark and say, we did good today. Are you kidding me? That kid has no shot. So we're going to teach our children about Jesus. We're going to teach them about Jesus. But folks, we have to have it to where it's very uniform. A parent brings their family. Man, they get here at 8.30. They have stuff going on. If they get here, now the ones that stay the whole time, they just transfer into the next thing. But the ones that get here at 10, they have a whole different set of things going on. And a family comes and they feel welcome. And they're like, yeah. This is the place for us because it's all about Jesus. Which means some of you are going to have to step up and help. But I get it. Now, not so much for y'all because y'all are maybe more the sleep-in group. 8 a.m. Uh, service, I, 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 you know, as Paul does when he's writing, I kind of uh, acknowledge some of the complaints. I said, I get it. If we start at 8.30, that's 30 minutes later you get to Shell Island on Sunday afternoons. If we start at 8.30, that's 30 minutes later that, that you get your tea time at the golf course. I get it. I get it. If your football team starts at 11 a.m., I get it. The NFL game, you might, you might be a little late getting to the, the kickoff during football season. Folks, those things are very, very mundane. And if we can reach families better for Jesus Christ, forget your Shell Island trip, forget your golf trip, Forget your football team until we have finished gathering on that Sunday. In a vain way, I'll tell you this too. This is a good crowd. But I long for the day, vain. I get it. I long for the day when that parking lot's full. I long for the day when we're pulling out chairs every Sunday, not just because it's some big event that people that never come are coming back for for one week. I long for that. And when we have 100 people walking out at about the same time that we have 160 people walking in, it is vain, but that builds excitement. And it will be good for our church. So, that's the first thing that I wanted to make you aware of. The next thing that I would like to make you aware of is the D groups that I've already mentioned. Learn the Bible, do life together, and make disciples. You know, Jesus told us to do that. Go and make disciples. And that's how I went ahead and settled on D group or discipleship group. 
We need to make sure we're following Jesus' command. And then, so that's just two things though, right? So that makes you average. (laughs) The studies, the books, you'll get two times a week out of people. I think you're better than that. I'm going to put the pressure on you. I'm asking everyone to put one hour of service in to Jesus Christ every week. On the 28th of this month, we're going to have some booze or tables out in the lobby of different ways that you can get involved serving Jesus. Yeah. Options for you. Because I'm telling you, if you don't get to where you serve, you will never get to where God wants you to be in your relationship with Jesus Christ. So for your life to be transformed today, come and gather on Sunday mornings. Be involved in a discipleship group and find some way, and I'll help you. And we'll train up the staff to make sure they can help you serve God every week. We have some great things going on here that a lot of you don't even know about. I'm going to go ahead and put a plug in for Vacation Bible School. I understand we didn't have it last year. I'm telling you, where I was, we did have it. And you can judge, judge me if you want to, and because I kind of put my foot down, and we went ahead and had in-person Vacation Bible School. We didn't have problems with COVID-19. We did keep the groups separated somewhat. But let me tell you something. We would have 45 to 55 children every day at Vacation Bible School, and five of them were saved. So let me say something. If it is important, it is important that children come and they gather and we tell them about Jesus. Now, God is going to save whoever he wants to save. I'm not in an argument on that. But on this side of it, if we wouldn't have told those kids about Jesus, who knows when they would have finally put their faith in him. And I don't want that blood on my hands. So we are going to do what we have to do to let the children know about Jesus. So we'll have our go day on February 28th. The last thing on gathering or coming that I want to share with you, and I'm very, very excited about this. They've accepted the challenge. I met with the entire team. But they're going to bring in other people that maybe don't come to our church. I've challenged them. I want a bunch of people up here as much as possible, and it'll take a few months for this to get going, but, I mean, blue hair, red hair, green hair, purple hair, earrings, nose rings, lip rings, I don't care about any of it, straight cut, just like me, high and tight, wear a sport coat and slacks, I don't care who it is, get them up here singing, get them up here playing about Jesus for First Wednesday worship every month. Six to seven on the first Wednesday of every month, Barry's going to have the group going, and we're going to basically just have ourselves. We hate to use the word jam session because of some of the things. We hate to use the word rock concert because of some of those things. But I've asked them, no songs over four years old. We're going to come together the first Wednesday night of every month, and we are going to have a celebration of Jesus. And so, yeah, praise God. They're up to the challenge. They're excited about it. There will be one song. I'll pray and welcome everybody. And for the rest of the hour, it will be just worshiping and praising God. But come to that. You'll be blessed. But I've also made him aware that at least for a while, it might be a concert for Kara and Jay and nobody else. (laughs) I don't know. I'm the pastor. I probably get to pull some stunts, right? Anyway, folks, God loves you. And you can't earn your salvation. It is by faith alone. But love him back. And a great way of showing him you love him back is by coming, gathering, the way that the Bible commanded us to do. As we close today, let me share this one verse of scripture with you. It's from Hebrews 10, 25. It says, let us not give up meeting together as some are in the habit of doing, but let us encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. Some of you viewing today may have never asked Jesus to come into your life and to be the Lord of your life. It's an easy thing to do. It's a simple thing to do. Realize that you're a sinner and just ask him to come into your life. You could pray a prayer like this. Lord Jesus, I realize that I'm a sinner. Would you come into my life? Would you clean me up? Would you make me acceptable to God? 
and restore a right relationship between me and him. Thank you for doing that. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, come join us next week at the Church at the Beach, Gulf Beach Baptist.